Okay. Good. Okay. So here we are with Dr. Eleanor Stein. This is uh, another uh, part of our What's Up Doc series. Uh, in our What's Doc Up what, in our What's Up Doc series, we uh, I talk to people. MECF experts, MECFS experts, fibromyalgia experts, long COVID experts, doctors, researchers, um, about what's exciting them uh, in the field. And it's really great to have Dr. Stein on uh, because she has such an interesting history. Um, Dr. Stein had chronic fatigue syndrome and chemical sensitivity for many years. Um, and she did everything she could to get over them. And that included flying all over, all over the place, trying so many different treatments, including some really exotic ones. Sure. Uh, and then to her surprise, uh, she got well um, using neuroplasticity. Um, as I remember, first, uh, the chemical sensitivities went, and um, and it took much took longer, but eventually the car fatigue syndrome went. So I, I just wanted to, um, well, so I just had a few questions about that, and then we'll get into the What's Up Doc series sure. uh, because it is it's a fascinating story. Um, so what did you use a specific practice uh, to get over neuroplasticity. That, that neuroplasticity practice that worked for you? Yeah, I used DNRS. DNRS, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I had heard about it from patients and friends, actually. You know, when you have MCS, you tend to surround yourself with other people who have the same thing. So I had not only, you know, hundreds of patients with MCS, but a few close friends. And um, <clears throat> a few of them started talking about DNRS and, you know, that neuroplasticity could really make a difference. And I was incredibly skeptical. For those of you who have known me, like I've known Court for probably a couple of decades, I'm not sure. So for people who have known me that long, you know, I've been hardcore biomedical from day one. Like if it doesn't have a complicated name in the description, I'm probably not interested. And so when people started saying what I consider a mind body intervention could really change what I considered a biomedical problem, i.e. MCS, I really didn't buy it. And then one of my most disabled MCS patients, like literally, you know, the one who's living in a tent, right? Because she can't be in any indoor airspace, did MCS, uh, did DNRS and got quite a bit better, like better enough she could rent a place, live inside, run her stove, her furnace, you know, these kind of basic things that you need in Canada. Uh, I definitely paid attention. And I thought, you know what, I should try it. I, I was planning a trip to Africa that was in 2014. And the woman I was going to be rooming with was a big user of fragrance products. And I was like, okay, I need something and I need it quick. Um, so I did this about three months before I was due to travel. Um, I took a week off work. So I don't do things uh, by half measures. So I took a week off work because that's what they say to do, like spend your whole week learning the process and practicing it. And I did that for a week. And by the end of the week, I would say my MCS was about 80% better. And I would say okay. now it's, you know, I'm never going to say 100% because I never really want to be around toxic fumes. <laughs> like right. that's not really a goal of mine, but I can pretty much go anywhere. Like I was somewhere really smelly just in the last week. There was some kind of acrid smoke and I was, I didn't like it, but I was totally fine health wise. And you, you, you had pretty severe MCS, didn't oh, you? Oh yeah. I was wearing uh, a mask. You're wearing a, I was a, avoiding a big, places, you know, not, I didn't not, have the respirator mask. mask, but I had a little mask. Yeah. Little mask. Okay. Okay with some like, it's called gray matter. It's like this carbon matrix oh, yeah, fabric. Right, right, yeah. Right. Yes, 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 yes. And I was, yeah, I mean, it was a big focus of my life trying to not be around stuff that was going to make me sick. Um, I would lose it on friends, right? I'd be like, how could you wear that laundry detergent, blah, blah, blah. And they'd be like, you know, if if you don't have the illness, you just don't get it. So it's totally I, that that's yeah. totally changed my life. I I pretty yeah. much don't even think about it now on a daily basis. 
that great? That's great. I I have I have MCS and uh, mm -hmm. boy, it has uh, it has caused so much turmoil and um, and eliminated so many things uh, that I mean, and I am I am actually better, quite a bit better than when I first had it. But still, for those who don't have it, it is the. the <laughs> the opportunities that it takes away from you are just incredible. Uh, uh, and so and with, with chronic fatigue syndrome, I, I believe it took, it took quite a bit longer. You kept yeah. doing the program. Uh, I kept doing the program and I did other things. So in 2015, so kind of it's layering, right? And mm -hmm. that's, that's what I think now about how do we get better? We have to layer. We have to mm. really take a holistic approach. What's going on with my body? What's going on with my mind? What's going on with my, you know, like all aspects. I didn't think mm -hmm. I'd be ever saying that in a public venue. Um, but yeah, so in 2015, I read Dr. Norman Deutsch's second book, uh, which oh, is yes. called The Brain's Way of Healing. And he has a chapter in there. I can't remember which chapter it is about red and infrared light therapy. And I just looked at that and went, are you kidding me? Light from the outside can make <laughs> me better. Like, I just didn't believe it because I thought, you know what? I went to medical school. This was not mentioned anywhere. So I went to the back of the book. I looked up all the references. I read them all. I did an online search. You know, at that time, back in 2015, there were maybe three or 4,000 references, including by you know, Michael Hamblin from Harvard, who's, you know, a super reputable researcher. And I just thought, mm. oh, my goodness, like this was a total gap in my knowledge. So I, again, don't do anything by half measure. So I immediately booked a plane to Toronto where there's a training program on how to use red and infrared light therapy. And I came home with my own very expensive professional grade system, which I've been using ever since. And uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm now the traveling uh, shrink. That's what someone's, the moniker, one of my YouTube followers suggested. So I'm in my van. You can't tell that because it looks like I'm in a beautiful location, like uh, just like Cord is. But actually, I'm in my van and my red and infrared light system is in my bike garage at the back of the van. Oh, great. So I brought it with me this time because I thought, I might be traveling for up to a year. I just don't want to be without it. So in real brief, because this really leads into our discussion mm -hmm. about hormesis, yeah. right? Which is what I'm excited about. And red light is an example of hormesis or beneficial stress. So what happens when you expose yourself to red, say about 640 nanometers frequency of light, or infrared, say about 900 and uh, sorry, 840, but there's a bit of a range there between eight and 900 usually works pretty well. Nanometers, those exact frequency of photons are absorbed by the mitochondria. Ooh. If you if you go back to your biochemistry days, you might remember that the mitochondria has this electron transport chain, and it basically shepherds electrons from the first part of the chain to the second part to the third part to the fourth mm. part and the fourth part is where we make atp or cellular energy and believe it or not these red and infrared photons are absorbed by this fourth part cytochrome cytochrome c oxidase they energize it and allow it to produce more atp than it otherwise would interesting free energy I, 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 so when i read this i was like i'm in right free energy <laughs> uh now the potential side effect is that whenever you make atp you also make free radicals and most mm -hmm. people know okay bad right free radicals are a form of oxidative stress but the reason i'm excited about hormesis which we're going to delve into in a little bit more depth is because it turns out the body needs stress that's the signal to the body to up its game. So what happens when we are exposed to the red or infrared light, we get the energy. So that's the short-term gain. We also have a short-term challenge, which is the, um, 
the oxidative stress, the free radicals. But luckily, we have this thing in our body called the uh, anti uh, uh, A R E. Oh, I'm blanking. Anyway, we have this inner machinery that allows the body to become better at managing oxidative stress. So instead of taking antioxidants on the outside that quenches the oxidative stress in the short term, but doesn't help our body whatsoever, if we actually challenge it with the right kind of stressors and red light happens to be one of those, we activate this thing called NERF2 and this whole, oh, I know, antioxidant um element, uh, the R, A, R, E, antioxidant something element. And it actually increases our capacity for a while, like hours to days of being able to handle oxidative stress. So the best strategy to make our body stronger is to actually expose it to certain kinds of stress. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, we we Health Rising has had a lot on oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. uh, and lately. usually and there's, I, a, I would there's guess, a lot of interest in it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. is it in what context court? So is it that it's bad or good or kind of where where are people? Oh, how are uh, people thinking about it? Uh, the, well, the, actually, the context is uh, too much oxidative stress. I, it's funny because it's it's. Um, it's um, too much oxidative stress because our T cells mm -hmm. are going bananas. Right. And, and they're just themselves. Pumpy, they're exhausting yeah. themselves. And in their exhausted yeah. state, they, they throw out tons of uh, uh, free radicals or reactive, reactive oxygen species, um, yeah. which suggests, which seems to suggest that this would be a good, this could be a good, uh, be, the red light because it's upping ATP production, which is, which is being inhibited in these, in these, if, if it can help the mitochondria out, then, um, then that would be, uh, that would be, that could be promising. No. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, if our cells had more energy, maybe the T cells wouldn't get exhausted. Right, right, right. They wouldn't so, get into that state in the first place. Just to use um, like a slightly oblique example, because that's one of my specialties. <laughs> uh, sleep, it turns out, you need energy to sleep, right? We think, oh, sleep uh -huh. is when you replenish your energy, <laughs> which is true in some ways. Oh we goodness. do a lot of repair doing, during sleep, but that repair takes energy. So mm. one of the things I say to people is if, so I always do it before bed by uh, my red light infrared. I mean, I okay. don't do it on purpose before bed. That's just kind of when it, it's part of my wind down routine. Uh, and if I have more energy, chances are I'm going to actually sleep better and then be mm. more re refreshed and restored in the morning. That so it's kind of like if the T cells had more energy, maybe they wouldn't get into this exhausted zombie like state where they're spewing out you know, inflammatory molecules. It's yes. Purely, purely hypothetical. That wasn't research-based comment. Right, right, right. Well, that that would uh, that I mean, I would think that would make sense. Um, so, so red light using the red light uh, photo photomodulation photomodulation yep. is that photobiomodulation? What it is? Is photobiomodulation. Yeah. That was one you started. That you know, you right, started that right. In one Twenty point, ten and it, years, and nine years ago. Okay. Okay. And that started, I think, slowly helping. I started noticing some little improvements in energy and sleep, but nothing dramatic. Mm -hmm. And then in 2016, so kind of one more year later, I did a big diet change. I had been super clean, you know, having MCS and food sensitivities, I had been super clean with my diet forever. Um, but one of my physicians as an offhand comment said, you know, you should try the autoimmune protocol. I'm like, what is that? I had never heard of it. So of course, doing nothing by half measures, I go buy three books on it, read up on it and started <laughs> it. And basically it's avoiding molecules in food that are antigenic or arousing the interest of the immune system. 
And those happen to be, so again, I just want to be really clear. I'm not recommending this for everybody because it's quite a limiting diet, but it's to avoid uh, dairy, eggs, seeds, nuts, and legumes. Oh, and grains, of course. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, what does that leave? So that basically leaves all kind of flesh. If I say meat, sometimes people go, oh, does that include chicken and fish? So yeah, all those kind of flesh uh, protein foods, um, all vegetables and all fruit. So that's what I eat three meals a day, snacks in between uh, fruits, vegetables and meat. And I stayed on it because I have another health problem that that diet really helps with. So I didn't stay on it because I noticed any difference to my energy. But then almost by accident, I had been on that diet for a year and a half. I remember it was September and I woke up and kind of went, you know, for the last month, my energy has been dramatically better. Like I used to crash out by five o'clock and just be, you know, have many wasted hours every day where I couldn't really accomplish anything, felt horrible, lying, you know, couch, couch, couch position. Um, and I just noticed that had just gone and I was able to do things in the evening after dinner, go for walks, visit with friends and feel totally fine. And that was September of 2017. So seven years ago. And that's, you know, we all have good days and bad days, but that's pretty much maintained itself for seven years. I'm, I, I now go to bed at 11 and wake up at seven. Oh, and great. I'm fully uh, and I'm fully functional in between. So that's yes. a dramatic difference. I used to wake up at 10 and be on the couch by five. Yeah, for right. like 20, oh, sure. 27 years. So it's basically reversed. Now I have 16 hours of function and eight hours of sleep. I used to pretty much be the reverse. So uh so the uh the photomodul photobiomodulation, the di autoimmune diet. And mm -hmm. then the uh, the brain retraining, the neuroplasticity. Yeah. Those were the those are the three three those major elements three that you big can see. New things. Uh -huh. And that yeah, was yeah. all on the foundation of all kinds of self management, right. right? That I had been doing for years, like um, I'll call it cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. So all of the evidence based strategies of how to get the best possible sleep. I was a master at pacing. You know, I had a polar uh, heart monitor like 25 years ago. So when I would <laughs> exercise, I would know what my energy envelope was and keep my heart rate in range. Um, I had been eating super clean. I had air filter. You can imagine with MCS, I had air filters all over my house. I had filtered water. Um, I've been in, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, so I believe in psychotherapy. I've done a ton of that to work on all my issues. So like I, I was really managing all of those components of self-management that I think is the foundation. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's kind of one of my messages that I've learned over the years. Like you can try the fancy new stuff and hopefully there's going to be some really cool, fancy new remedies coming out for ME and long COVID. And it's going to, that fancy stuff is going to work so much better if you've got a solid self-management foundation. Yeah. I, I, so that's what I, I think happened to me. I think sense, all that yeah. self-management for 27 years kept me in the game so that when I found these new layers, I was actually able to benefit from them. Got it. Got it. And it just, and it took time. It, was, it took time. Oh it was my not, gosh. 27 was not, years. <laughs> 27 years. Yes. And then, and then, then you <gasps> woke up that one day and you realized, oh, I'm doing better. Something has changed. Yeah. Something has changed. The, the realization came over you and then over time you're able to i guess you, you start pushing your boundaries a bit more mm -hmm. exercising a bit more now you mm -hmm. you i remember last time we talked you just got on a 20k bike ride or something like that 20 so, mile it was a good day and 20 mile, <laughs> 20 mile bike ride. Yeah. yeah i can exer i exercise pretty much every day for one to two hours like i don't go crazy i'm not doing you know 20 mile hikes right mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. i'm 60 so you know but I am pushing it a little bit more because of of what we're going to talk about, this concept of hormesis, that mm -hmm. if you push your body, it has the capacity to respond. Now, I think probably that capacity is more robust 
the more mild our symptoms, right? I mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like that's mm -hmm. something I'm really actively thinking about. Well, will these strategies work for the severely ill who can barely move their pinky without crashing? Mm, I think I think the more severely ill you are, the more incredibly careful and cautious and yeah. graduated you would have to be. But I think the principles, I mean, they're human principles, they're they're principles of all animal species, right? Not just humans, that animals like say cold, that's another hormetic or benef beneficial stress. If you expose mm -hmm. yourself to cold, your body goes, oh, I get it. I need to up my metabolism to cope with this cold stress. And it then makes changes accordingly. And if you never expose yourself to cold, and I was, I'm older, I was moving in that direction. Oh, I've got like the big down coat whenever I go out and the hat and the mitts, right? I live in Canada. I thought, you know what? I'm going to get away from that. I'm going to allow myself to be cold sometimes to give my body the message that I want it to continue knowing how to produce enough heat on its own. If I wear down all the time when it's chilly out, it's going to think it's fine. There's no, why should it up its metabolism if right. I'm taking care of it? So, so hormesis, mm -hmm. does that, does that word, that's, that's an odd word. Where Do you know where it comes from? Is that oh, I don't like court. a, ah, hormesis, do it's such know. an interesting word. It sounds Greek or something. I don't know. Uh, it but could so be. Her, her, hormesis is the um, process by which uh, stress makes us stronger is is that yeah is that is that how, how would you how would you i'll say stressors it? right stressors? so stress okay. sometimes we stress think scores. oh does that mean psychological stress right but right. i'm actually referring to all kinds of stressors uh physical and psychological and so the best term i just heard it recently actually is adaptive stress so okay. some stress or stressors are just plain harmful Right. And and just for like anyone listening, please, you know, perk up your ears right now, because some stuff is just harmful and don't try to adapt to it. So uh, the, mo the most common example to that is air pollution or, you know, man made mm -hmm. toxic chemicals. We don't adapt to that. So purposely exposing yourself to low doses of toxic chemicals will not improve your ability to handle them. They'll just build up in your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is it. different mm -hmm. from MCS, where our brain is hypersensitive to to tiny amounts that aren't really toxic, right? So I'm it gets a little bit confusing. So MCS, the brain is on overdrive. It's yes. responding to a danger that's not there, or uh -huh. it's overreacting to a tiny, tiny danger. What I'm talking about is like if I go to the gas pump and breathe in the fumes on purpose thinking that's going to allow my body to handle gas fumes better. That's not going to work. All I'll do is intoxicate myself. Right, so it has to right, be right. certain kinds of stressors. And the stressors that seem to work are the ones that are part of our natural environment. And evolutionarily, that makes total sense. Because, of course, all organisms have to learn to deal with those kind of changes or stressors in the natural environment things like light and dark heat and cold feast and famine you know right. those would be the three um uh what do you call it like spectra that come to mind every organism that's that hasn't gone extinct has had to find a way to cope and adapt with those kind of like common stressors right right Right. I'm think I'm wondering, so we have this, it seems like we're kind of in this chronic stress response. Mm -hmm. In any way, how does how does yeah. that play into these, you know, these into uh kind of expanding our ability to uh deal with these innate biological stretch stressors, which seems it seems to be a health healthy thing. It seems to be a seems to be a healthy thing that we're challenged, we're challenged in some ways, um, and and I have heard that, you know, being in a tightly controlled 
tightly temperature controlled environment is not necessarily is perhaps not good for you. On the other hand, you know, some people have a lot of problems. With so it, yeah. it is, it is, it is, uh, I, I guess everybody has to figure it out themselves, but so could this, could this, um, look at this hormesis kind of relieve this kind of, uh, you know, this wired stress response that we're in? Do you think done, done correctly? Or that does anybody know? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure someone I'm sure someone's looking into it. I'll give my best answer again, not evidence-based, just opinion based on, mm -hmm. on what I've read. So the chronic stress response typically happens when we're exposed to stuff kind of nonstop. Mm -hmm. So one mm -hmm. of the aspects of hormesis is that to be effective, so I, I said the first criteria is that it has to be certain types of stressors, right? Not, mm -hmm. not toxic chemicals, for example. But the second is the dose <laughs> has to be correct. So it has to mm -hmm. be a relatively low dose that mm -hmm. the cells in the body recognize as stressful and can respond to effectively. So if, it, if they're exposed to too much stress, they just shut down. Like if, if you consider the cell danger response, that's what happens when the stress is too great. I was, I was just wondering about that, how yeah. that, how that plays it, how the, that plays into this. Um... So the, the dose has to be right and the timing uh -huh. has to be right. So for a stress to be adaptive instead of harmful, it has to be intermittent because then it has to give the body and the cells a chance to respond, right? So okay. if I just expose myself to red light constantly, for days and days, and I never give my cells a break, I'm not going to, I'll still get some ATP out of it, but I'm not going to get the adaptive response because I have to give the cells a break and give mm. them time to go, oh, I get it. You want me to improve the antioxidant capacity. Okay, leave that with me. It's now going to take a few hours. I don't know the exact timing or maybe even days for the cells to kind of upregulate the nerf 2 and the antioxidant response element. That's it. Antioxidant response element, A-R-E. That's the, the pathways or the network in the body that we're trying to upregulate by mm -hmm. using the red light therapy. So here's what I think. I think for anyone who's under chronic stress, probably the most helpful thing for me personally, and this is kind of where my own neuroplasticity practice came in, that was incredibly helpful was I changed my perspective on life. So even though I had a pretty good life, before I practiced neuroplasticity, I often felt stuck. You know, my health was crappy. I felt limited. Mm -hmm. I was very focused on what I didn't have right. and right. what I missed out on. You know, I still look back and think, wow, that was like 27 years of life that I'm not going to get back. So I was kind of focused on the glass half empty. Is that how it works? The, the negative, the pessimism? Yes, 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 yes. And one of the basic tenets of neuroplasticity practice, regardless of whose program, you know, I've developed my own program now, kind of integrating what I've learned. So it doesn't matter which program you use, is you have to elevate your mood for a oh, couple of okay. reasons. One is... The BDNF, the actual machinery that allows us to form new neural circuits, works best if our mood is, I'll say, at an extreme. Mm. Now, of course, that can be a negative extreme, and that's why trauma sticks in our mind forever, right? And it's mm. so hard to get rid of. We obviously are not aiming for that. We're aiming for the positive mood-elevated extreme. And so if you pay attention to the, the change you're trying to learn or practice and you do it repeatedly because changing brain pathways takes repetition and you elevate your mood in some way to reinforce the practice so the brain really gets the message this is important and worth paying attention to you're going to have a better effect and so as I was doing my neuroplasticity practice Part of it is to continually every day do things that will elevate your mood. And mm. that shifted my just 
you know, I was never depressed or anything, but I just had this like low level, like life could be better kind of feeling. And it's really shifted now to one of gratitude where I'm like, mm. well, especially now that I'm in my van traveling across Canada, like what could be better? So I think to change, and, and then I've done a ton of research recently on chronic stress. And what I realize is it's how we perceive it. So mm. I've worked with thousands of patients over the past 25 years, and I've I've continually been amazed at some of the most ill patients who from the outside look like their lives are the most difficult imaginable. Mm -hmm. Say these would be the adult children who are 40 or 50 living with their parents because they can't look after themselves mm. in poverty because they can't work and their parents can't work because they're retired and they're looking after their adult children. You know, these really difficult scenarios. These have been some of the most inspiring, upbeat, positive people I've ever worked with. Mm. And so it just became clear to me over time, observing my patients, that objective circumstance is not the determinant of whether I feel stress or not. Okay. Right? It's, it's mm -hmm. my perception of that circumstance mm. so some people two people could have the exact same circumstance and one person could be absolutely miserable and continually focused on the have-nots what they don't mm -hmm. have and what they wish they could have that's mm -hmm. of course in buddhism a recipe for misery and another person in objectively very similar circumstances could be like you know what life is good i can do this this and this I have a loving family looking after me. I'm on social security that's enabling me to not be on the street. Like they're focused on the positive. Mm -hmm. And the only difference is their perception. So I think anyone who's experiencing chronic stress, you know, how would you know that your heart rate is up, you're sleeping poorly, you feel stressed and anxious and worried and angry and frustrated. I would, the first thing I would do is really look at perception and is there, you know, start a gratitude practice. And I know that sounds kind of like, really, are you kidding me? But I just have to say for me, it's made a huge difference. Like I'm just so much lighter and happier and I can't help but wonder whether that's contributed to my health benefit, uh, health improvement. Like I can't prove it. I have no idea, but I don't think it hurt. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I I know that that's something. This is something I kind of work with and struggle with. And uh, and when I when I am, I am in that better space. I definitely, I definitely feel better. I I, I have this interesting practice from these landmark seminars I do, mm -hmm. uh, which is it's a little it's a little different twist, um, but the the uh, practice was uh practice is this is what life looks like when it's working and uh which makes me which makes because i have i have you know i have thought god i shouldn't feel this you know i shouldn't feel this terrible i wish to deal with all this angst and anxiety and da 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 da, da. But but it kind of it kind of makes me think this is ex exactly what I'm supposed to be going through, and that's right. that's that's what's life that's working. Well, it's life looks like it's working as I'm dealing with these things. So, you know, so and that and that just it it, it light it does lighten me up. It lightens me up. Yeah. Um, and I I think Court maybe you're talking about accept like some degree of acceptance rather oh, than sure. fighting. Yes. Yeah. And yes, I've been yes, really yes. working on that lately. Like. Uh, you know, I've had some recent health challenges and I'm just like, or grr, right? Like I just got this freedom and now a new one, hit, you know, a new couple challenges have right. hit me. It's like, this is not fair. So if I focus on that, I'm going to be miserable right, and it's right, not right. going to help. And yeah. just in every moment I have the choice, do I focus on the negative or the positive? Now, I'm not saying like for anyone listening, oh, this is the cure to ME. No, no, no. But this is a layer. You know, Court and I were talking about <laughs> layers. This is a layer for me. And I, I think for, for the most part, when I when I see people get better, it is it is a bunch of. It's often a bunch of little things that take mm -hmm. time. 
that take time, different different layers, as you say. Um, well, but and so and so back to back to back to hormesis. So mm -hmm. these um so there are there are specific can you go over I think you mentioned temperature, yeah, uh oxygen, yep. light, and any other there are other yeah, practices. So let me just go can... to my little list here because I, I have a bit of a cheat sheet court. So uh the... oh I'm muted. No, I don't see. Did you say I'm muted? No, 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 no. I, I, I Oh, just, did you want me to just, share the cheat sheet? No, no. I just mumbled something underneath. My oh, desk. okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, I was just using my cheat sheet cause you know, so I don't forget any of the important mm -hmm. ones. So I would say the biggest one and the most studied is, uh, how full or hungry we are. So again, if you think about evolution, every species of animal on earth sometimes has more food and sometimes has less food. And the stress there of having less food is that we become more metabolically flexible. So what do I mean by that? Metabolic flexibility is the ability to burn sugar or fat. And it's just like tens of thousands of studies like really well accepted in science that that's a good thing that when sugar is available we want to be able to burn it because it's easy and quick and we want to benefit from it but when it's not available we want to be able to burn fat that has a whole separate group of benefits and mm -hmm. if we so that's the benefit of fasting is that we keep the machinery for both of those capacities ready to go so that they're there when we need it if we never fast and i'm again not speaking from experience here because i find fasting incredibly challenging so i'm speaking from science here um, but if we never fast the machinery we need to burn fat breaks down because if you don't use it you lose it that's how the body works it doesn't keep stuff around just in case of a rainy day um and so people with, we'll say, uh, recent numbers I've heard is that 93% of Americans, and I'm sure Canadians are very close to that, have poor metabolic health. Yeah. And what that means is they're overweight, they have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, and have some degree of insulin resistance. That's kind of the definition of poor metabolic health. Uh, and oh, and high um high triglycerides, those five things. Right. So that's bad. Like those five things called metabolic syndrome increase our risk for what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, cancer, heart disease, dementia, cancer, heart disease, dementia, and metabolic diabetes. and diabetes. Yeah, diabetes. those yeah. four things. And all four of them are killers, right? They're the four biggest yeah. killers in all developed countries. So that alone, like if we don't even go any further with hormesis, the adaptive stress of hunger or fasting or having your nutrient levels dipping a little bit below normal is like literally life-saving because it protects us from those four big killers. Isn't that something? I was just listening to uh, Peter Atia mm -hmm. and... Um... I don't know. I don't know if it was intermittent fasting. I think it was caloric reduction that yes. it, it has yeah. been, it, it has been, it is solid, you know, some degree of caloric reduction yeah. is solid, uh, is solid. It's, it's the science is solid that it, it really does help with longevity. And it's he doesn't, he doesn't recommend people it's become hormesis. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, I hormesis? interrupted. Yeah, That's yeah, how it works, yeah. you know. So I had known about intermittent fasting for years, but it's only when I started studying hormesis, I'm like, oh, I get it. This is how it works. There's these nutrient sensors. And when they sense hunger, they do all these good things. They start repairing because when you don't have nutrients, you can't waste anything. You have to fix it. You can't just build new cells because you don't have the nutrients to do it. So you have to right. fix the ones you have. And oh, so okay. that's where uh, getting rid of the beta amyloid that causes Alzheimer. Well, I won't say causes that is associated with Alzheimer's disease and 
clearing out fat from your liver and uh, remodeling your brain and clearing out garbage at night, like all of that, um, fixing DNA, fixing proteins, lengthening telomeres, like all these things that are associated with longevity only happen when we activate these hormetic pathways. Interesting. Interesting. Well, he talked about um, problems with fatty liver. Yeah. Uh, fat de fat deposits on our organs. The 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 fat deposits that you can't see. Yeah. Those 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 are the real those are the real killers. And people who are skinny can have them. People who are yeah. not skinny can have them. Uh, and but it sounds like if you get into this, if you get so we should talk about how long you need to mm -hmm. the intermittent fast has to be in order for the this kind of fat switch to the fat uh, metabolism. Uh, and you know, and, and I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what this has to do with fatty acid metabolism, but I know that's a problem in uh, uh, in MECFS. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that, if that, if that, if that, if those two go together, or you know, or if you know, you know, having this switch to fat to fat metabolism would help with that. I, I really have no idea. But um... yeah, boy, that's another really good question. Um, what I can say, so I've done quite a bit of reading, probably. Um, so I've listened to Peter Atia as well. He's got some great guests on his podcast and um, Matt Caberlin. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. He's kind of one of the experts on rapamycin. So mm. again, I'm being a bit digressive, but the whole benefit of rapamycin, a drug that many of you probably listening have heard of, is that it boosts all of these hormet? I'm calling them hormetic pathways or mm -hmm. longevity enhancing pathways. So it's like a external, you know, the most reliable and cheapest and safest ways to improve our health are through these natural things like fasting, light exposure, uh, temperature, you know, exposing us ourselves to a little bit on un uncomfortable temperatures, even even a little bit less oxygen. So we all know that when you live at altitude, your cardiovascular system is a little bit healthier. And when you come back down to say sea level, you're going to be like superhero, right? It's because the stress of not having quite enough oxygen activates these pathways that allows our cells to adapt and to utilize oxygen more efficiently. So there's kind of a common theme to all of these but you were just asking me, um, so there's fasting, heat, cold, red and infrared light, um, oxygen levels that I just mentioned. And another one I haven't mentioned yet is um, eating fruits and vegetables. Right, so right. I always thought, well, oh, they're good for you because they have all these good nutrients, right? Well, you just, just have... one question, just, oh, just yeah, one yeah. question. Mm -hmm. With regard to the intermittent fasting, do they know oh, yes, how yes. long you have to? Yes. At what point is that. it after like 10 hours or so six hours? So <laughs> there's a bit of a expanded answer. Dr. Sachin Panda, P-A-N-D-A, -A, he's really one of the people who's looked into this a lot and his area is circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So what he said, he's done a study, or I'm not sure if it's his study, but someone reputable did a study showing that I think it's 14% only, 14% of Americans, sorry, they get picked on, uh, keep their eating to a 12-hour window. Ah. Now, this okay. is the minimum. According to the research, a 12-hour fast every night, so meaning, say, you stop eating at 8 p.m., you have nothing with any calories in it. Of course, you can have water and take your medications but nothing with any calories in it till 8 a.m. So that would be considered time-restricted eating. You're restricting the time within which you eat to 12 hours. That's the least that will have any hope of these beneficial adaptations. Okay. Now, most people who are hardcore would say, oh, 12 hours isn't, um, a 12-hour fast isn't long enough. And they would say, 14 to 16 hour fast, you know, they've done the research is going to get you better into ketosis 
than a 12 hour fast. But I love Dr. Panda's approach because he's very practical and he said, okay, most Americans are eating like up to 10 times a day and they're eating for 40, 14 to 16 hours. So it's just like my, my energy and sleep cycle. The goal is to switch that. So instead of eating for 14 to 16 hours, you, ideally you want to be fasting for 14 to 16 hours. You don't have to do it every day. So again, he's very practical. He goes, you know what? Aim for five times a week, take a couple of days off. How are you going to get there? Because say if you're only fasting for eight hours, you can't just say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to fast for 14 hours. You're going to feel horrible. Why? Because you're not metabolically adapted, right? All of mm -hmm. that machinery to burn fat doesn't exist or is in a <laughs> decrepit state. And you got to like remind your cells that that's one of your goals for them. And they need to work on this and reestablish all that machinery. So what I suggest is start first, figure out what your eating window is, say it's 10 hours, try to expand it by half an hour for the next week, try to go to 10 and a half, right? Every week, see if you can up it by half an hour. If you fall off the wagon, that's just too much. It's just like pacing, right? See what you can do when you hit your limit, pull back a bit, let your body adjust. And then, you know, cautiously try it again. Dr. Panda feels that any person, irrespective of age, gender, or health condition, should be able to manage 12 hours. And so mm -hmm. that's really his goal for like the population as a whole, is if people can fast for 12 hours, he thinks that's enough to see health benefits. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. What, what, how is your, um, how is your intermittent fasting oh, doing going? I don't intermittently fast. So there's a terminology issue. So I do time restricted eating. Okay. I restrict my eating every day to, uh, 12 hours max, pretty much a hundred percent of the time. And if I'm having a really good day, or I ate an especially big dinner the night before, I can often stretch that out to like 14, 15 hours. So that's kind of my routine where I really fall down. So true confessions, timing is important. So remember when I mentioned tormesis, I said, well, it's the type of the stress, the amount of the stress and the timing of the stress. So when we look at time restricted eating, it's not only, uh, what you eat and for how long you eat, but when that window of eating is, the ideal window is to stop eating three hours before bed. Right, right, right. So to eat earlier in the day, not to, you know, have one meal at 9 p.m. That's not, that wouldn't be as advantageous. It, 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 yeah. Is that a main meal? Is that a big meal for you? Uh, I, I sometimes... You know, I'll have something and then at 10, 11 o'clock, I'm just. I know. I I'm do the just, same you know, thing. I'm just so like, the wow, goal, I got to like have what, something. <laughs> yeah, what they say, I mean, all the researchers I've listened to are saying, basically, Dr. Panda gets up and eats it. He gets up at six, he eats at eight. Okay. And then I think he eats around 1 p.m. and then around 6 p.m., if I remember incorrectly. Okay. So I think he mm -hmm. himself fasts for 14 hours but he front loads the eating. So the big protein and fat and calories ideally are supposed to be earlier in the day, the breakfast and the lunch. Okay. And okay. the dinner should be maybe a little bit more carbs because that helps with sleep and, and a lighter meal. Got it. So okay. I have, that's where I fall down. I can do the fasting, but I think I got a psychological issue with not eating before bedtime. So Okay. I'm, I'm that's my goal. That's my daily goal <laughs> is to stop eating by say eight o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is. Uh, it, it is. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. Sometimes I can do it and some, and sometimes I can't. And, and the beauty well, of Dr. Panda's approach is he goes 80% is good enough. Yeah. You good, don't have good. to be perfect. So everyone mm -hmm. can like exhale, give it your best shot. You don't make it no problem try again try it differently you know try different foods like yeah anything is better than nothing nice, nice. yeah yeah that's a nice approach nice approach 
I suppose. Okay. Uh, so that's intermittent fasting. Um, and temperature? Did... Oh, yes. I've temperature. Tried it. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a sauna back in like, you know, I started going to all these environmental medicine meetings, functional medicine meetings, and they're all over sauna. So I bought a sauna back in about 2001. I love my sauna. I use it very regularly when I'm at home. Wait, is it, is it infrared or is it um, the, the Mine, old, it, old school? Mine is infrared, but you know, I've heard some experts say, probably it doesn't matter that much you just okay. need to sweat so whatever yeah. you can do to sweat doesn't have to be fancy and and I would add to that you want to sweat for at least 10 minutes per session mm -hmm. so when you go in the sauna you don't start sweating right away right it takes a while yeah. for your body to heat up and then you get that like irritable sticky phase and you really like, grr and then you sweat and you go yes at least that's what happens to me. I think that's when the endorphins come out. So the research, um, Susanna Soberg, she's kind of now the current uh, world expert on this heat and cold exposure. If I remember correctly, her research shows that you want to sauna four to seven times a week. So okay. this one takes pretty frequent, you know, that's a lot of time, but like, a lot of people, I, I don't manage that. I have to be honest. If I do it a couple of times a week, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, and you want each sauna episode to be about 20 minutes. And I would add to that, you want at least 10 minutes of that to be active sweating. Okay. So sweating is your body's communication to you that you, you're stressing it. Right? Oh, yes. <laughs> you're stressing it enough. It's heard you and it's responding by sweating. Now, I bought my sauna because I wanted to detox, right? Because I had chemical sensitivity. I knew nothing about hormesis. I barely had even heard the term back then. But now we know that that the heat of the sauna actually activates many of the same response elements as exercise. So mm. you're, I have a sauna oh, where really? I can lie down because, you know, I love my comfort. So I'm lying down with my feet up. I built this little wooden bench. So, cause the heat up is super feet up is super relaxing for me. And when you sweat, your heart uh, speeds up, your blood pressure goes up. So it's many of the same physical responses as exercise. And you activate something called heat shock protein, which is a really beneficial kind of hormetic pathway. And uh, so I just recently, you know, in the last couple of years learned that sauna, not only does it, is it the most effective way to detoxify, but it also encourages your body to become better adapted to heat. And that has, mm -hmm. and, and it's many of the same benefits as exercise. So for people that can't exercise, you know, sauna may be an option. Boy, that, that is a, that is a, uh. If it works out, that that would be a tremendous uh, opportunity because we are we are missing so many health benefits by yeah. exercise. Exercise is another thing that Peter. Oh right, I didn't Atiyah, even mention exercise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that, the big one, right? It's the big one. It it yeah. it improves it improves longevity. It's like it improves so many things, and uh, you know if if we could substitute at you know maybe just at least parts of it by doing mm -hmm. sauna that would really be something i i i actually had uh, a really interesting experience with sauna decades ago mm -hmm. i went to um dr ray dr ray's oh, environmental wow. health center yeah, yeah. in uh dallas yeah yeah and he had and so we had us you know on the bicycles and i couldn't i couldn't do the bicycles you know but <laughs> but i um you know, and I really pushed it in the sauna. Um, I think I started at one. I ended up at two sessions a day. I was and just going to say he does two a day. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. did. He's passed away, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, to be honest, I, I felt uh, I felt awful. <laughs> well, I, I actually got a sauna. I actually I actually got uh, well, anyway. So I felt awful. And then I'm driving back to California and all of a sudden I'm just like, wow, I feel great. 
you know, it, it really, you know, something really happened there, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I probably pushed it too hard and I got a sauna and I, and I had problems. I still have it. It's in storage. Um, and I, and I've really had problems accessing it, but, but right. there's a, there's a point in the sauna when you, when I start sweating and you can, it's just dripping, drip, 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 drip. And I just feel great. I just feel yeah. great. Afterwards, uh, I can get hit pretty hard, uh, right. but I've never been able to. It's a bit dehydrating, to... so I find hydration critical. Hydration, like, yeah. I drink like two. Oh, you can't really see it, but two large bottles. Uh -huh. You know, in I start fluid loading a good half hour before the sauna. Yeah. And okay. Continue okay. through the sauna, and then yeah. after with electrolytes. So for right. me, because I'm. Uh, hypovolemic and have pots and all that stuff yes. you know the the hydration is really critical yeah 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 boy that i mean if if, if that, that sounds like a real opportunity for those who could um take it well what and so heat there's heat and what about cold, cold? you must cold. be very well acquainted with cold living where you are i am but you know i've Just become a step princess out the door as I sometimes age. There's... yeah like i said uh -huh. i was wearing the down coat and the hat and the mitts <laughs> and the scarf and the balaclava um and i now like i'm here in saskatchewan and it's being cold and blessed i've been on the road for a month and it's been pretty much cold and blustery and rainy the whole time oh, i really? just thought yeah. you know what i'm going out without my layers yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go for a walk and allow my body to be cold and then heat up. So it's okay. just a new strategy I've literally been doing in the last couple months. So the cold, the cold is, believe it or not, it also activates heat shock protein, which activate so bizarrely. Heat and cold have many of the same benefits. The big mm -hmm. benefit of cold is it increases metabolism, right? So if okay. you're cold enough to shiver. So just like sweating is your body's way of telling you it got the message, it's too hot. Shivering is your body's way of telling you it got the message and it's too cold. So, so that's kind of the key. Like people say, well, how long do I need to stay in the sauna? How long do I need to stay in the cold bath or whatever it is, cold shower? It's till you start shivering. Then you know oh, your body's okay. got the message and it's going to make some adaptations to be able to handle that better. And in the case of cold, it's to increase metabolism, including increasing numbers and function of mitochondria. You know, oh, so for people with ME, anything that improves mitochondria function gets our attention. How, how, do they, do they, do we know how cold you have to be to? Uh, cold enough um, to shiver. So that's going to be different. Just cold enough to shiver. That's, that's to when, be okay. different for everyone. Now, the yeah. hard for uh, Scandinavian plunge in the ocean all year round people apparently the ocean there is about 50 i might have this slightly wrong but 12 to 15 degrees in summer centigrade so that's in the 50s and it's yes. like really cold like in the high 30s low 40s in the winter so that's very cold and you know there's a whole culture yeah. yeah so yeah. you only have to stay in for about three minutes you don't have to stay in there forever mm -hmm. Um, and the protocol, again, from Dr. Soberg is overall in a week to cold expose for about 11 or 12 minutes. And you can break that up however you wish. So if you're a bit cold adapted, because once you do it regularly, you can stay in longer because now your body's got that met those metabolic adaptations to allow you to do it. So you could like I have a friend who's big into cold plunging. She can stay in 10 to 15 minutes in mm. in a outdoor bath with ice in it like Whoa. i am not i am not there so oh, i've goodness. been doing cold showers that's pretty much so i'll do my sauna and then when i uh shower after the sauna i'll do a cold shower and i'll that's... make sure i stay in for three minutes and okay. then if you're really hardcore you don't dry off with a towel you let the water evaporate off your body you know how cold that makes you that is, um, that's, yeah, that's stunning <laughs> stuff, stunning stuff. And what, what about, you know, people who put ice, they put ice in their bath. Yeah, that's uh, it. And it's the same, uh, same general 
Yeah, you draw a bath, you put ice in it. Doesn't it doesn't it help your parasympathetic nervous system? Have you heard that? Uh, oh, yes. Thank you for mentioning. Uh, so uh, the other benefit, so there's the hormetic benefit, like you improve your metabolism. But the other benefit is every time you get really cold, it's an opportunity to practice calming your body. Because as you can imagine, as soon as you get into that bath, you're, you go... <gasps> right? Your, your adrenaline yes, yes. goes through the roof. Your sympathetic is like danger, danger. What do you think you're doing? And you're like, your breathing is no longer steady. You're like, <laughs> right? Your heart rate goes up everything. So the cold plungers I've talked to, they're like, so I breathe slowly on purpose. I think happy thoughts. I focus on breath. And they are training themselves every single time they get in that cold to strengthen their i would say vagal activation their vagal tone mm, interesting and and so and then there and then there's breathing as well these 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 yeah. really fundamental these really are very fundamental hot cold breathing yeah. um so breathing and there there really is a lot of interest in breathing i've i've um well i've enrolled in in David Petrino's Mio program. I haven't started it yet, but I know a real it, it, breathing is a real emphasis. Uh, and uh, it was started by uh, a seal members of the SEAL team, team, you know, who go into very dangerous situations. And and you know, they say that breathing is, you know, breathing is key uh, to be able to operate in those. So how about so how about breathing? Uh, what what could we do to breathing to and what would does that increase oxygen? Um, uh -oh. Hello? Oh, Hi. Dear. You know what? I'm just going to check because I just, I don't know if that was me. I just know uh -huh. it's saying I'm good. Okay. I just was it, like, uh oh, am I having problems with my... Oh, right. No, according to my... Um, Starlink app it didn't have an outage. So sorry about oh. that, Court. No problem. No problem. Go ahead. What were you? So breathe. What? What? Oh, how, how can we breathing to increase oxygen levels? Is that is that what it? it, it so does? I'm just I'm not an expert on this. So I'll kind of uh, share what I've learned fairly recently. Uh, well, not that recently, like over the last three years, basically since COVID's been on the scene, right? And breathing has been really at the forefront. So I had a, I, the, the very first webinar I did at the beginning of COVID was with a breathing physiotherapist. And what she explained is that many of us who are chronically ill are actually hyperventilating. Now, when oh, I yes. heard this years ago, of course, I took it personally, Right. <laughs> Like we get criticized, we're lazy, we're depressed, and now we're hyperventilating. <laughs> ah, so, but she explained that it's, I guess it's like a normal physiologic response to not having enough energy. We breathe harder to try to, you know, unconsciously, of course, this isn't any, none of this is on purpose to try to get more oxygen. Right, right, right. But what happens is it backfires. So here's my understanding of it. The more we breathe, the more carbon dioxide we breathe out. And when we breathe out too much carbon dioxide, we become more alkaline because carbon dioxide is acidic. It changes very, very slightly the pH in our body. Now, when the oxygen gets from our lungs to the tissues, it doesn't dissociate from the hemoglobin. Mm, we mm. actually get into this vicious cycle. So in long COVID, there's, you know, I've been on clinicaltrials.gov. There's a bunch of uh, studies underway of different breathing protocols. And I think mm. I'm guessing that they're mostly trying to help people get out of this, you know, unconsciously acquired vicious cycle in which they're just hyper breathing, which makes them get even less oxygen to the tissues and makes them want to, I, you know, that might be what's behind the air hunger. So that mm -hmm, this physio mm -hmm. who did the webinar, Jessica DeMars, she's uh, in Calgary, very skilled. 
And that's what she kind of explained. Cause I said, if you can explain air hunger to my audience, you know, this is an, a question I couldn't answer. And that was her understanding of it from her training. Well, and I'll just say uh, yes. David Systrom's research, right? So the yes. Harvard researcher who's mm -hmm. doing this invasive CPET, he's actually able to measure the oxygen between the veins and the arteries. And sure enough, we're not giving up enough oxygen to the tissues. So he's now proven mm. it with, you know, very scientific evidence. Like you can't get much more hardcore than what he's doing. I would not volunteer for his study, just saying. It just it's, looks it, really rough. Um, but he's yes. basically proven that this uh, hypothesis probably has some truth to it. Yes, yes, yes. He's also, he's also found a lot of hypocapnia, low uh, low CO2 levels in M yeah. MECFS as well. Well, that's so exactly we, what I was just saying. So we breathe out. When mm -hmm. we breathe harder, we lose CO2, and that's what hypercapnia right. is. Which, which can cause many of the symptoms mm -hmm. associated with uh, MECFS. So, yeah. so if we if we can regulate our breathing, if we can change our breathing patterns, and I and what I remember reading uh, years ago that you know breathing is one of the things that we do. We can even even if I mean this is it, it is occurring. It's not occurring consciously. Right. Uh, something something is wrong with our metabolic system, I guess, that is causing people with uh, MECFS and the other disease to breathe strangely during exercise. That's been found several times. Uh, but we do, but I have read that we do, we can exert conscious control over our breathing. So is that is that what you're, is that what they do so. at hormesis? Uh-huh. Um, so that you can actually you can actually train yourself to breathe right. in a more in a more a healthier pattern. Um, so again, uh, this isn't my area of expertise, but what I gather from listening to uh I think his name is Patrick McEwen. He's a breathing expert. So I've mm -hmm, I've listened mm -hmm. to a couple of his uh podcasts and he says we basic it is a hormetic stress because when you hold your breath you know, there's fancy devices that will actually remove a little bit of oxygen, but apparently you can just do it by slowing the breath enough that the carbon dioxide builds up and you have to relearn the ability to tolerate that high, higher carbon dioxide in oh, your body because you're now so used to blowing it off, right? And having mm. this hypocapnic or low level. So it's again, building the adaptation or the tolerance to that higher carbon dioxide so that you can breathe with more ease. So breathing experts say you should breathe slowly, quietly, uh, shallowly. Like everybody thinks you should breathe deeply, but actually right. it's much more functional to breathe uh, as little as possible and have that oxygen be used as efficiently as possible. Yeah, you know, when you're in, when you're in a meditative state, <laughs> Mm -hmm. which I've only reached a few times. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I noticed that it, it's just the slightest breath. When I'm in a very calm state, it's just the slightest in and out. Just it's, it almost seems like it's, it's, it's too little to sustain you. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting that, that that's, it's, it's a very comfortable feeling uh, mm, when you're, when, and it's light, it's very light. It's very light. Yeah. So are there are there there specific? Do you recommend specific practices for people to try? You know try? what? I'm not I'm not expert enough, so I'm I'm okay. gonna kind of refrain. But I would say, I hope I have the name right, Pat Patrick McEwen, and he worked with he Ari Witten. So many of your mm -hmm. viewers may know Ari. He's a runs a program called the Energy Blueprint, and mm -hmm. he teamed up with Patrick. Hopefully I have his name right. So there's a course on Ari's webpage, something about breathing. And there's three module. I haven't done it myself, but there's three modules to the course. Kind of one is how to optimize breathing if you're healthy, like if you're an athlete and you just want to use your oxygen more efficiently. Uh, one is for people specifically with anxiety, right? Because mm -hmm. that really messes up breathing. And then the third one is for people with low energy or fatigue. 
Uh, so there's three different mm -hmm. tracks, and I believe the strategies are slightly different for those three scenarios. Interesting, interesting. I, I know there's a, uh, Salva Me has funded a inspiratory breathing uh, uh, oh, clinical okay. trial in, okay. uh, in MECFS. And like you said, there are several trials underway in uh, long COVID. Yeah. Uh, so we should we should we should be getting some more information on that um, soon. Uh, okay. Good. 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 And I think I don't know if we've hit food. Oh yeah. Food Just yet? well, we've talked about the time restricted eating, and I, right, I guess the right. the other part of diet is what you eat. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you eat, super important. Uh, but what you eat also very important. And the key message is from a hormesis, of course, you could talk about that for hours, but from a hormesis perspective, or what would be uh an adaptive stress, it's to eat fruits and vegetables. You might go, well, why would that be a, a push for adaptation? And it's because Fruits and vegetables contain phytonutrients, the things that give them their color. And those phytonutrients, believe it or not, are just a little bit toxic to our body. So never enough, you know, that unless uh, when I was uh, working on my handout, my proofreader said, well, you could say like, don't eat 55 bananas. But then we thought that was a bit too extreme. So of course you can overdo anything, right? So just to say, but so we're not talking in um, that these fruits and vegetables are generally eaten in amounts that would be toxic, but at the cellular level, they're hormetic stressors. They just say to the cell, oh, I'm like, I'm not entirely comfortable with you being here. I'm going to up my game and improve whatever it is. You know, each phytonutrient probably triggers slightly different pathways. For example, we know the color of the fruit and vegetable, uh, each color has a different impact. Like I think blue is for brain, red is for heart. I can't remember. Uh, I think maybe yellow is for immune system. I might have those slightly confused. So in general, each color of phytonutrient has different physiologic effects and it's through hormesis, meaning it challenges our body to adapt and improve its own skill rather than just providing so i call it like back in the day we were told i went to all these medical conferences where we were encouraged to encourage our patients to take antioxidants mm -hmm. right? everybody's yes. heard of that to get rid of these damaging free radicals but the studies have never really borne that out in fact some of the studies show that antioxidants in certain people can make them worse and even have heart attacks. Yeah, That's a vitamin E study. So like mm -hmm. what's going on there? We now know that passively taking antioxidants is not that beneficial, maybe, maybe even harmful, but taking or hermetic stress, these phytonutrients that upregulates our own antioxidant capacity, this ARE, um, antioxidant, response element that has long lasting beneficial effects and it's free. So, you know, supplements are very expensive and they don't actually change your system. They're, they're just like a drug in that way. They're a bandaid. And then you mm. have to take another one four hours mm -hmm. later, 12 hours later. But if you use a hormetic stress that increases our body's own capacity for health, that is a much longer lasting effect and you didn't have to pay for it. So, so, so um, it's funny cause you know, so I guess these, uh, the, many, many of these are like plant defense elements, you know, exactly. that plants yeah. have to protect themselves yeah. and we have to, we have to break them down, you know? Um, and then you have something like white flower, which is, so it has no plant it body just sucks it in but it's 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 terrible it's terrible for you um and that's probably an example of something that's not hormetic like you know you right, can take all right. the white flour in the world you're not going to somehow make it healthy for you 
Right. So that's right, a great right. example, right? Whereas these fruits and vegetables that are a little bit annoying and the body goes, ouch, that yes. is hormetic because it's just at the right dose. Like you're not going to eat 10 pomegranates. You're going to eat half a pomegranate, right? right? So it's just at the right dose that the body can handle and respond to and adapt. So I, I guess you, you would want, you would, you would, you'd probably want as, as diverse a, uh, a diet, uh, you know, and I know a lot yeah. of us, you know, we end up with, with really kind of re very, at least diverse with regard to vegetables and fruits. Yeah. yeah. And we, we end up with, you know, we, had, some, some of us end up with very restricted diets. Uh, and it's, you know, sometimes it just gets, it gets worse and worse, but, um, uh, but this challenging with different, uh, different kinds of vegetables. I mean, I tend to eat similar vegetables. I eat a lot of vegetables, but I tend to eat the same vegetables. And I, and I remember early in my MECFS journey, my uh, the first doctor I saw, she was an allergist, and she was very big on a uh, um, what do you call it? A um, oh boy, big brain. This is this is ridiculous. A uh, elimination. Well, it's not elimination. Oh, elimination. I guess it was elimination. Yeah. But it, a rotation, it was rotation, something rotation. like that. Rotation. It was a rotation yeah. diet. That was that was a really big thing back then. Um, yeah, I did it. But it, but that sounds that sounds like it, it. You know, it makes sense. You know, you you uh, you kind of challenge your body with different different foods because it is a challenge. You have to digest them mm -hmm. um, from fish to meat to you know guavas to to whatever. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, yeah, I, that's that sounds that that sounds like that would be helpful. Uh, I had never and heard I, of again, it. Again, it's something. The, yeah, it's something really simple because you just say, okay, this week, every week when I go shopping, I try to buy one food I don't normally eat. Right, right, right. I don't need right. it. I don't have to eat it every week. Maybe it's really expensive. Like this morning, they had fiddleheads. You know, they're ten dollars for a little thing. I didn't buy it. Right. You know, <laughs> cost comes into it, but I did buy the the orange oh, golden berries or something so that's something mm -hmm. i never buy it's going to be a treat might not buy it again for another couple months or i don't know when they're in season you know in the summer of course i'm going to eat more different fruits and vegetables because uh, hopefully there's going to be farmers markets everywhere i go across the country and i'll be able to really splurge and try different foods different kinds of greens different you know different kinds of herbs herbs yeah. and spices of course are like super intense phytonutrient sources if okay. you can tolerate them. Have we have we hit the have we hit the uh hit most of them, the, yeah. The, the, the top. Yeah. Now the, these these um so there, there's 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 a nice array of these. Um you know I imagine they they you know they 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 would all produce kind of maybe kind of subtle subtle effects at least at first yes have you, like have you, you, have you, you tried wouldn't this out notice with... yeah yeah like i don't this... think we would ne necessarily notice it's kind of like taking supplements right most of the time right. I, I never notice a difference but with this i'm just doing it anyway so i think what i may notice is if i continue the cold exposure and going out without my 17 layers mm -hmm. i'm going to notice that i'm more tolerant to cold a bit more robust. You'll be a bit yeah. more robust. Yes. If I, yeah. you know, I'm going to be traveling through some really hot areas and I'm I'm going, I'm going to be so chicken, I'm going to go out in the sun more with my hat like yourself. And mm -hmm. hopefully I'll become more heat tolerant as a result. Yes. And as I continue to work on my time restricted eating, I'm already noticing that to the, the, the extent I can avoid simple sugars and carbs it's just so much easier to fast. Like that's for oh, me, that's just the nail in the coffin. If I like a friend's birthday was on the weekend and I had the ice cream cake and uh, it's taken me a few days to recover. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I, 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 so I, I noticed that I, it's tangible. If I stick to my diet and I avoid those, uh, for me, it's the simple and complex carbs. I can fast much more easily for longer. Got it. Well, well they are we... noticeable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you, have you, have you had your patients like take on this kind of 
this this uh, melange of of uh, practices. Well, and, uh, you know, I retired, right? So I don't have patients oh, anymore. Okay. okay. So I retired a year and a half ago, and now I'm I'm doing this, right? I'm trying to spread my knowledge through online platforms to reach a broader audience. But before, you know, I was advocating sauna for the last 25 years, and I had a mm -hmm. sauna, I had a home office, and um, patients were welcome to use my sauna, and many did and really liked it. And then when I came upon red and infrared light therapy, again, I treated many patients and many of them bought their own systems because they had such a positive result. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those two uh, definitely are pretty tried and tested, and there's a ton of okay. research um the cold exposure is newer for me so it's not something in fact um you know i used to run an assessment team called the e-team and the kinesiologist on the team he would do the two-day cpet and then he would advise people to do ice baths like in between the two and after the second test and the the patients would come in and say oh that was amazing like i recovered from that you know, exercise challenge so much faster. I'm not even tired or sore. And I was like, you're crazy is what you are. Cause I couldn't imagine on purpose making myself freezing, but I guess the research is pretty strong. So in the exercise uh, field, it's used routinely. Like most athletes use cold exposure after they train as a way to recover faster. There's many, many uses. Yeah. And there there are cold uh cryotherapy, I guess they're called they're calling yeah. cryotherapy uh trials going on in uh fibromyalgia right oh, now. Really? Okay. Um and uh and so and with with, with health rising, we're gonna go over cryotherapy, we're gonna go over photomodulation over time, we're gonna certainly do breathing, uh mm -hmm. oh, breathing fantastic. breathing stuff. What about and did what about exercise? Is there? I mean, that is certainly a a a nice stressor that yeah that you know we all we all have you know we all have our difficulties with. Uh, is there is there? Can, can you recommend anything with regard to you know kind of very slowly expanding your ability to exercise? Um, sure. So I'll just say you know, um, court hopefully is going to leave a link attached to this video where you can get a free handout that kind of mm -hmm. summarizes a lot of what I've said, right? Because I'm sure it's a lot to take in and probably yes. some of you are like, oh, okay, that was too much. So we've got a handout for you. Now, I did not include exercise in the handout because I didn't want everyone to lose it on me and say, <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? You're telling us to exercise? Do you not understand ME? <laughs> so what I've called all these other strategies is I've given them the label exercise sparing or mesis, meaning things you can do that might have some of the same effects as exercise without exercise. Uh -huh. But <laughs> if we now shift to exercise, I think exercise and fasting are the two, I don't know, say the king and queen of hormesis, right? The two most mm. effective, uh, most well-studied strategies. With exercise, it has two main effects from what I can see. One is that it really upregulates our uh, cell and protein repair mechanisms. Because if you think with exercise, you're actually d making little micro tears and damages to your muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. When you stop exercise, you have to give your body a chance to repair all of that. So it has to keep all the repair networks like ready for action if you're exercising. If you're never exercising, all those networks and pathways are going to, again, kind of go into quiescence and not be ready when you need them. And of course, the other thing is when we exercise, we get a little bit short on oxygen, a little bit short on fuel. So that's why it benefits cardiovascular health so much, because it makes us manage our resources more efficiently and just makes us stronger, like yeah. makes the heart stronger so it can pump more. So my approach to exercise is know your energy envelope right? That Leonard Jason talks about. How do you figure that out? Very briefly. I use uh, a tracker. So um, I did a talk. It's, mm -hmm. if, if it's, I think it's already up on my webpage. It's called how to use a wearable tracker to improve your pacing. 
something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's my newest video on my webpage. And I did that. That was an invitation by um, Emmy International because they're actually helping some of their members, you know, acquire trackers and learn how to use oh, them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. really uh, brief. The tracker helps you know how recovered you are from the day before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you look at your morning heart rate and your morning heart rate variability. If they're good, and I won't go into depth what that means, but if your heart rate is low and your heart rate variability is high, that means you're well recovered, whatever that mm -hmm. means for you. And you can probably do more that day. So if you're trying to push your energy, you know, your, your activity window a little bit, so that you can have some of the benefits of exercise as a hormetic stress, that would be the day to do it. Then when you're doing it, you have to know your own capacity and your early warning signs of a crash, right? So I am not saying to anyone, no pain, no gain. That does not work. That will end, you know, end you up in a huge prolonged crash. What I am saying is, if you know your own personal heart rate window at which you can safely exercise without crashing. That's where the, the real time heart rate monitor comes in. Say you've got a, a watch that tells you your heart rate and you know how long you can exercise without crashing, then you want to do that. So say you know that you can walk for 10 minutes at a heart rate not exceeding 100 beats per minute. That might literally be to the end of the block and back if you're, say, moderately ill. You would do that maybe every other day for a couple of weeks and make sure you're really solid with that before you make any changes. So the single biggest mistake people make is they move ahead too fast because they so desperately want to be able to do more, right? They can't wait. Please be patient. Once you've established a very sustainable, consistent amount of exercise you can do. And for some people with orthostatic intolerance, it might have to be horizontal. So for me, for example, swimming, which is horizontal, has always been better tolerated for me than say some vertical exercises. And it's also a bit of a temperature hormetic stress because my personal neighborhood pool is a tiny bit cold. <laughs> So then you've got this sustainable, you know, I can, I can very uh, reliably do 10 minutes at a heart rate of 100 three times a week. Then the next week, you might say, you know what, I'm going to take the duration, not the intensity, but the duration up by 10%. So that means next week, I'm going to do 11 minutes at a heart rate of 100 three times a week. Only when you've significantly increased your duration to literally like 30 minutes, so quite a big advance, should you then try to increase the intensity. So you always mm. increase the duration first. That's okay. much easier. And then when you can do like 30 minutes at 100 beats per minute, then you might say, okay, now I'm going to let, I'm going to walk a tiny bit faster and allow my heart rate to get to 105 108 mm -hmm. right again it's really baby steps if you want to be successful got it got it that's good you know just anything we can do you know anything we can because it because you know the studies show it is such a such an important thing anything to yeah you know help out in that area would 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 would, would, would be great be great so uh, yeah. so you're you, you mentioned you're not practicing anymore you're you're traveling around in your van. You're doing. <laughs> you're you're a, you're a digital nomad, just like just like myself. Yeah, I know. Um, and so, what is so? And now you're doing a new uh, a new a new program. Can you mm -hmm. can you uh, can you explain what that is? Um, sure. So on my website, I have a ton of resources. Many of them are free, like this video on uh, wearable trackers that I just mentioned. And I also mm -hmm. have a YouTube channel, so a lot of videos are there as well. If you go to my webpage, eleanorsteinmd.ca, CA stands for Canada, not California. Um, there's some tabs across the top. And to start with the free stuff, go to the tab called Free Resources. On there, you can sign up for my newsletter, which comes once a month. You will not be bombarded, and I'm not trying to sell anything. It's just letting you know when I've put a new blog out or a new video and some upcoming events. Um, 
I have a lot of free videos and a growing video library, some audio files. Um, I have a resource page. So, you know, other people's websites, organizations, like I think court might be on that list, for example, of great resources. And then I have a tab called upcoming events. So that's where you can see upcoming live events uh, where like, like we had one today, for example, with an expert on Lyme disease. So that's how you would know in advance to be able to register for those. And then I have a tab called store. And the first thing on store is called um, live courses or live sessions. And the one I'm really proud of and excited about right now is called Live with Dr. Stein. So I have a bunch of self-study courses and I kept, and although people really like them, I kept getting the feedback. They really want to move beyond those, right? Like they don't want to just do the course and then, okay, that's it. They want to keep learning. So I'm uh, meeting with that live community uh, twice, uh, every other Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain. And the goal and the topic selection is basically a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today. It's how to leverage the daily decisions you make about diet and lifestyle to improve your health. Sometimes we talk about things that cost money, but my big emphasis is on what I'm calling low to no cost strategies because I want it to be accessible yes. to everybody, right? And so many people in the community are just so impoverished by the, the duration of time that they haven't been able to work, for example. Now, it is a membership and it does cost money. So it's kind of a subscription like um, Netflix. You sign up, you can stay signed up for as long as you want. While you're signed up, you get access to all the live sessions with me. And you also get access to a, like the Lime Talk today that's a once a month with an outside expert. Because mm -hmm. I'm the first to admit there's tons of stuff I don't know about. And I'd rather have you learn from an expert. There's also a moderated community. So you can like continue chatting about whatever you heard in between sessions. And then, and you also get access to all the previous sessions for up to a year. So the content stays on the site. And if you join uh, so that you're kind of not just thrown into it and you can see how we've led up to that point, you can access all of that. And the topic is really how to increase health span and lifespan. Right. So there's no mm. point to live to 100 if you're in bed. Right. None of us want that. We want to know how can we upgrade or activate or encourage our body's natural healing uh, capacity, like everything we've been talking about today it would be really typical of what we cover. Got it. Got it. I like the idea of health span. Spend yeah. the amount of time that you're healthy or relatively healthy, or at least don't come down with a major chronic, another major chronic problem. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, very good. Well, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for spending the time. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. And, and yeah, and health rising. And yep. uh, you're always doing really interesting stuff. You're, you, you're always, uh, you're <laughs> always out there searching out. Uh, new possibilities. So, uh, yeah, I hope we. And I, so, I hope we can uh, we can do this again. Uh, I I would love to future. court. And just a reminder, hopefully, court's going to put a link to this free handout on hormesis. So again, it will fill in some of the gaps and help remind you of some of the material we've covered today. And it has specific protocols like do this, this, and this for each of uh, four different strategies. Yes, that is very helpful. That is very helpful. Yes, we'll, cer we'll certainly have that link on there. Uh, okay. So good. Well, well, happy travels. Thank you. Uh, you too. You're heading east. I'm east heading east. So Canada, I'm in Saskatchewan, the... and I'm I'm headed to Labrador. To to the you're taking the northern route, and yeah. and what what is the temperature right now? What is? You know, probably right now, it doesn't feel too bad. I'm guessing it's about. 17 outside which is 17. like mm, low 60s let's say oh low 60s okay yeah okay it's, it's pretty reasonable now it was pretty chilly this morning <laughs> and how how long will it take you to get to uh 
Well, I have a ticket bought for a ferry that goes up the Labrador coast and stops in a little, a few different, um, what they're called outports, like places with no roads. And the only way you can get there is by ship. So uh -huh. that ticket is for um, August 4th. So I have to be in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador on August 4th. And Happy Valley Goose Bay, if that name sounds familiar, it's because that's where people were diverted to on 9-11 and the film or the play, um, uh, what is it? Home, not Home From Away, uh, Come From Away. It's a musical, very, very popular musical, Come From Away, telling the story of these nine jumbo jets that were headed towards New York and had to be diverted on 9-11. And Happy Valley Goose Bay has this old like Air Force base from the Cold War or something like that that was still functional. So they diverted these nine jumbo jets to like a town of, I don't know if there's even 300 people there or something. Oh my God. And, and it's the story about the warm welcome they got and, you know, we're taken into people's homes and fed meals. And so it's a really heartwarming oh, story. So I just felt like I have to go there. There you go. There you go. See it for myself. You'll, you'll be getting pretty close to Greenland, I guess. Yeah, I have been to Greenland, actually. But this, oh, okay. no, okay. there's like water yeah. between, you know, Canada and Greenland. But yes, I will be right on the coast. And probably, I don't know if on a clear day you could see Greenland or it's probably a bit far away. Right. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're quite the, um, I know you went to Antarctica. Um, I did. Last year or so, so. Yeah. So exploration is in your blood. No? Okay. All I right. think we well, might have you. that in common. Like, look at your background. Yes, it's gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, and we are. I'm camping in uh, outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, right now. Nice. Okay. All right. Thanks, well. Court. Well. Thank you again. And okay. uh, Happy travels. Same to you. Bye bye. Hey. Okay, bye bye. Oh.